Hello, saints, peace and grace in Christ Jesus be with all of you. In God's word, we read Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I'm sad to report that this verse is indeed true. Much of the body of Christ is either willingly ignorant of God's word or intentionally made ignorant by teachers who refuse to teach God's word rightly divided. Now either way, the body of Christ is starving for knowledge today. There's a famine in the land and it's not a physical food type of famine, it's a spiritual food famine. The enemy knows just how much the body of Christ lacks in knowledge of God's word today and many times the enemy will confront Christians by using the very words of God, by twisting God's word, by removing verses, by adding words to the Bible to confuse and confound the saints. And in most cases, the saints don't know the difference because unfortunately, the saints don't know their Bibles. They place the sword of truth on the ground. They remove their breastplates of righteousness they kick off their shoes, they remove all armor and let the enemy have a field day with them. Friends, it's so very important that you study God's Word on a daily basis. What does Paul tell Timothy about the importance of studying the Word of God? In 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Today, we're going to answer the question, is Jesus God? Is Jesus the Lord God? Is Jesus the Father? Are they one and the same? Now, the one thing, the most often used uh, attack Muslims will use when confronting people is telling them that Jesus isn't God, that he never proclaimed to be God, and they twist scripture to try to make their statements seem correct. If you don't know your Bible, you'll be speechless. You're not going to be able to confront the enemy's attacks. Again, Muslims will twist scripture. The one thing they'll do is they'll use a newer version of the Bible because the newer versions are plagued with errors. And the Muslims are quick to use these errors to confuse the truth. If you don't know the King James Version Bible, you don't know what it says. All and all you're used to is is like the newer versions which contain errors then how will you be able to fight wrong information if you don't know the right information another very important reason you must you must have a King James Bible and stay away from the newer versions as much as you can like I said they'll take certain verses out of context and make it seem as if Jesus never claimed to be God. Another thing Muslims will do is they'll deny the Apostle Paul. They'll call Paul a false apostle. So they'll say something along these lines. Uh, without using Paul's books, show me where it says that Jesus is God, that Jesus is equal with the Father in heaven. And if you don't know your Bible, you're going to have a hard time proving that Jesus is indeed God. Now today we're going to take a look at some areas in God's Word that claim and prove that indeed Jesus is God. Jesus and the Father are one and the same using the entire Bible and not just Paul's books. We're going to see a situation in the book of Matthew. Jesus asked his disciples a question. Let's take a look at this. In Matthew 16, 13 to 20, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, 
and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shall loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now Peter, also called Simon Barjona, answers correctly. And Jesus is quick to commend him because of his answer. So what's significant about Peter? Peter was a Jew, number one. And Peter had listened his entire life to the teachings in the synagogues. Most importantly, Peter heard in those teachings all the prophecies of old. The prophecies made by people like Moses and David and Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Micah and Hosea, all of them. Peter knew that one day, according to the, the, those prophecies, their Messiah, our Christ, would come to establish the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven on earth. Peter here is fully convinced that this Jesus is that Messiah, the one prophesied in Scripture. Peter also said Jesus was the Son of the living God. What does that mean? It meant Peter recognized Jesus was indeed divine. What was Jesus' response? He tells Peter he's, he was blessed and his answer was right because Jesus himself revealed it to him. Jesus declares that he'd give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven and that those keys would give Peter authority to bind and loose things bound on earth would be bound in heaven and so on. This in itself it was an a extremely remarkable statement. Who can give that kind of authority? Can a man give that authority? No, only God can grant such authority. So here, Jesus reveals that he's God. Jesus not only taught his disciples that he was God, he reveals this truth to those even that opposed him by his statements and by his deeds. Consider the confrontation Jesus had with the Jewish authorities. And John recorded this in John 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him in John 8, 31 to 32, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This verse sets the context for the argument. Among those who heard Jesus' words were those of the Jewish religious establishment who didn't believe him, but were constantly trying to confound, accuse, and condemn him. Upon hearing Jesus, they replied with much sarcasm. They answered in John 8.33, They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man, how sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And John records his answer in John eight thirty four to thirty eight. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house for ever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. So here we see a full-blown argument. The Pharisees continued to assert their righteousness and declared Abraham was their father. Now note their statement and how Jesus replies in John 8:39 to 47. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if, if God were your Father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you need not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? 
ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you, why do ye not believe me? Ye, he that is of God, heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. The Jews here responded by stating that Jesus was a demonically possessed man. And Jesus responded to their insult by invoking his obedience to God and his own authority over death itself. Verse 48 to 51, Then answered the Jews, And Jesus unto him, Say, We not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. So we see here the Jews couldn't comprehend this answer. They didn't understand it. They couldn't believe that they were speaking with the actual creator, the God of Israel himself. So we see them reply. Verse 52 and 53. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Now Jesus is quick to point out here that they're religious but far from God. He ends by making a statement about Abraham. Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. In verse 57, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and, ha and hast thou seen Abraham? Notice Jesus' response here. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And their reaction, Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. So what did Jesus say to make them angry enough to throw stones at, them, at him? Jesus' words truly truly were an idiom that meant listen up. What I'm telling you, you can take to the bank. That's what got their attention. Then he said the words, and this is translated truly truly I say, present active indicative I am or keep saying to you before Abraham came into being I am before Abraham was born Jesus existed Jesus didn't say I became but he said he said I am because he never came into being he existed all along before Abraham was even born now don't think for a second that the Jews didn't understand what Jesus was saying they got it they knew what he was saying. They knew scripture. Their minds immediately flashed to God's word, uh, what he said to Moses back in Exodus. In Exodus 3, verse 13, all the way to 14. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they, say, They'll, they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. What Jesus was telling these Jews was that he was the God of the Bible. He was the eternal, ever existing one, the I am. 
that he was God Almighty and they knew exactly what Jesus was saying and that's why they got mad and stoned him. They tried to stone, stone him. Another important uh, point is that Jesus forgave sin. Jesus not only made claims of his divinity, he proved his words with deeds. In other words, he put his money where his mouth was. He not only talked the talk, but he walked the walk. We see this. Jesus had a huge healing ministry. He healed thousands. Luke recorded a dramatic healing of a paralyzed man in Luke 5, 17 to 26. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law, attorneys sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal them and behold men brought in a bed a man which was taken with palsy and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him and when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling which his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee? or to say rise up and walk but that ye may know that the son of man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins he said unto the sick of the palsy i say unto thee arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house and immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house glorifying god and they were all amazed and they glorified god and were filled with fear saying we have seen strange things today and here we find a situation where jesus was teaching while some some of the pharisees and the lawyers were present some jews approached carrying a paralyzed man trying to get jesus's attention they heard about all of his teaching his healing ministry but it was crowded okay they had a hard time getting close to jesus so they climbed the roof they enter in from above they lower the lame man down to the crowd and Jesus is observing this he was impressed and what did he say to them in Luke 5 20 and when he saw their faith he said unto him man thy sins are forgiven thee and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying who is this which speaketh blasphemies who can forgive sins but God alone they were right only God can forgive sins what was Jesus's response in verse 22 23 and 24 but when Jesus perceived their thoughts he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts, whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. Jesus asked the religious leaders with a question. He asked them, What's easier? to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk what's the answer to the question it's easier to say your sins are forgiven that requires no proof so what did Jesus do he gave them proof he demonstrates proof by healing the man now it's important not to miss the significance of Jesus's statement if you do something wrong to me I can forgive you and the matter is closed but this man had done nothing against Jesus and yet Jesus declared that his sins were forgiven if a regular person went around forgiving people whom he had never seen before and had or any dealings with we would call the person a cuckoo a nut but Jesus wasn't mad he considers the fact of the matter that he was the person offended by sin and to prove it he healed the man Another thing not to overlook here in Luke's statement is that Jesus saw their faith. Who can see faith but God? Luke recorded the reaction of the man and the crowd in 25 and 26. And immediately he rose up before them and took up 
there whereon he lay and departed to his own house glorifying God and they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying we have seen a strange thing today another thing Jesus healed the blind one of the greatest miracles Jesus performed was healing a blind man John wrote that this man was blind from birth in John 9 Jesus healed the man and the man was taken to the Pharisees to show them that he'd been healed and the Pharisees kept asking him how were you healed and the man keeps repeating over and over again just how he was healed but they refused to listen or believe him so they asked the man's parents but his parents were afraid to answer so the parents then reversed the situation again and tell the Pharisees to ask their son back and forth so they did ask the son and then they get into an argument with him no one's more testy and self-righteous than religious people even today the former blind man wasn't uneducated still he he gives the Pharisees a theological lesson okay look at John 9 John 9 30 to 33 the man answered and said unto them why herein is a marvelous thing that ye need know not from whence he is and yet he hath opened mine eyes now we know that God heareth not sinners but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will him he heareth since the world began was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind if this man were not of God he could do nothing and of course unable to respond the Jews Excommunica uh, excommunicated him in John 9 34 and when Jesus hears about this he makes a special effort to find this man whom he had healed and to speak with him in John verse 5 35 to 41 Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he had found him he said unto him dost thou believe on the Son of God and he answered and said who is he Lord that I might believe on him and Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Now the term Son of Man was the title Jesus took upon himself to identify himself with man as the God-man or the Messiah. God used this nomenclature many times in the, in the book of Ezekiel. And Jesus asked the man if he believed in the Son of Man. When the man asked him who he was, Jesus declared that he was the Son of Man, that is, the Messiah. The man believed and worshipped him. Only God is worthy of worship, according to the Ten Commandments. Jesus accepted this worship, for he is God. It's important to understand here that Jesus welcomes worship. And Jesus knew full well what the commandment said. That God alone is to be worshipped. And Jesus knew this. He was welcoming worship because he is God. There's added proof. Another very important point is Jesus is the only way. Shortly before the crucifixion, Jesus spoke words to comfort his disciples. He declared that he was the only way to God. Notice, he, he didn't say a way. He said the way. And John recorded in John 14, 1 through 6, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So here we see that Jesus is equal to the Father. 
Now, continuing in his discourse, Jesus said that if anyone knew him, he also knew the Father. And Philip, not understanding, asked to see the Father. And Jesus declared that those who had seen him had seen the Father. And John recorded this in John 14, 7 to 12. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and hath and have seen him. Philip say, saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He, do, he doeth the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now another point here is we know God created the world. And we see that Jesus is the, the one that creates. He's the creator. And Moses wrote about this in Genesis uh, two four regarding the creation of the world. This is the account of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. The Lord God made the heaven and the earth. We know from a number of scriptures and from Jesus' own words that he is God. Jesus Christ is the one who created the universe, the heaven and the earth. And we see this in John and Colossians and Hebrews and Ephesians and Corinthians. Jesus rose from the dead. There's only one being who has the power to rise from the dead. No man had ever done this before or ever will unless God is the one. Only God can raise the dead. The scriptures teach that Jesus rose from the dead and for the body of Christ he did this this is the proof that Jesus paid for our sins and satisfied the righteousness of a holy God this is our gospel in 1st Corinthians 15 1 through 5 now the reaction of the disciples to Jesus's resurrection is undeniable proof of Jesus's resurrection and in 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 fact no other rational explanation can explain the changes that took place in their behavior unless they had witnessed it. The resurrection turned them from terrified cowards to being bold as lions. Why? They'd seen the resurrected Lord. They touched him. They ate with him. They listened to him speak. This was their proof. So, you know, since the, the Muslims, they obviously hate Paul. They call Paul a false apostle. They ignore the 13 books that Paul wrote. Then they say there's no proof in the Bible that Jesus is God. Oh, really? Let's look at the rest of the Bible. There, you know, there's 66 books in the Bible. Paul wrote 13. Let's see if the rest of God's word clearly shows Jesus as being God or Jesus is not being equal with God. Shall we? In John 1st. John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word was God and the Word was God in John 1 14 and the Word became flesh and the Word became flesh and the Word was God and the Word became flesh why is that so hard to understand? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who dwelt among us? Jesus. Right. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In John 5.18, Therefore the Jews sought 
the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. In John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believeth not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now notice the Greek translation here, the word he is not there. The word he was added here in this verse, okay? So it actually reads, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. In John 8, 5, 8, I'm sorry, John 8, verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Am. In Exodus 3.14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. In John 10, verse 30 to 33, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father for which of those works do ye stone me and the G and Jews answered him saying for a good work we stone thee not but for blasphemy and because that thou being a man makest thyself God they understood what he said when he said I and my father are one the Jews were were uh, familiar with that phrase and it meant I and the father are the same one I am the father that's what he's saying and that's why they stoned him. And the last part of that, and because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. He made himself God. In John 20, 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Who is he speaking to here? He's speaking to Jesus. When Jesus said, Thomas, why do you doubt me? Take your hand and stick it in my side. Thomas took his hand, stuck it in Jesus' side to prove that it was him. Doubting Thomas could not believe unless he actually touched him and stuck his hand into his side. And then Thomas clearly says, with awe, my Lord and my God. Colossians 2.9 For in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, including you, Muslims, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father and that every tongue that includes you Muslims should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father in Hebrews 1 8 but unto the Son he saith thy throne O God is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom and this is quoted from Psalm 45 6 Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. In Matthew 4.10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. In Matthew 2.2, 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? 
For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. In Matthew 2.11 And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. Ding, ding, ding. Muslims, they worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. According to the Ten Commandments, who's the only one that we're supposed to worship? If we worship anyone else but that only one, we're committing idolatry according to his own commandments. But we see the Magi came and what did they do? They worshipped him. In Matthew 14 33 Then they that were in the ship came and hello, oh, what's this word? Hello. Worshipped him saying of a truth thou art the son of God. In Matthew 28 9 And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and, hello, what's this word? Worshipped him. Now, obviously, Jesus was there and they were worshipping him. Did Jesus stop them? We know full well that Jesus knew the Ten Commandments. We know full well that if they had been committing idolatry, he would have told them. He would have rebuked them that right there on the spot. He would have told them, do not worship me. Right? No. He doesn't do that. He allows them to worship him because he is God in the flesh. In John 9, 35 to 38, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Wow! Wow! You mean Jesus is saying that they saw God? and are speaking to God and are worshiping God when they see Jesus worshiping Jesus speaking to Jesus could it be true yes yes it is true hallelujah 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 Hebrews 1 6 and again when he bringeth in the first begotten unto the world he saith and let all the angels of God worship him the angels of God were worshiping Jesus wouldn't it be a huge contradiction if God wrote down in his commandment thou shall not worship thou shall not have any other gods besides me and then turn around and say hey angels go ahead and worship this guy my friends that's not how it works God does he never ever ever goes back on his word he never changes something he did before without admitting it yes God has repented he has repented he has changed his mind but he makes note of it in his word but this isn't one of those cases he told the angels of God to worship him Jesus is prayed to all the time in Acts 7, 55-60. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Jesus was standing on the right hand of God, not Muhammad. Muhammad's dead in the grave. He's turned long ago to dust by the eating of worms. 
Okay, here we see Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopping their ears and ran upon up to him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul and they stoned Stephen calling upon God saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit <clears throat> and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice Lord lay not this sin to their charge and when he had said this he fell asleep in other words he died and that ended the dispensation of the law and the dispensation of grace began through Saul <clears throat> when he was converted and renamed Paul in 1st Corinthians 1 verses 1 and 2 Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God the Sosthenes our brother unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. The phrase to call upon the name of the Lord is a phrase used to designate prayer and worship. 1 Kings 18.24 And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire let him be God and all the people answered and said it is well spoken and Zechariah 13 9 and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried they shall call on my name remember what I said what that means they will be praying and worshiping me and I will hear them I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God the Lord Jesus here they're talking about friends in Romans 10 13 and 14 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved the name of the Lord is Jesus Christ Christ Jesus how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Paul is speaking of calling upon Jesus. The phrase, call upon the name of the Lord, is quoted all the way back in Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered now understand Joel was written long before Jesus was born and he's talking about who soever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered that's Jesus for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call Lord here is the I am the name of God is revealed in Exodus 3:14. therefore this quote dealing with God himself is attributed to Jesus here first and last the I am the je suis and I'll show you something very interesting about the French phrase je suis in a minute in Isaiah 44 6 Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last so who touched him here in Revelation 1 17 Jesus touched him the I am first and the last I in verse 18 I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and 
have the keys of hell and of death. It's very extremely important to understand what I just read. Again, verse 18. I am, that's Jesus, he that liveth, okay, and was dead, right? He was living, he was killed, and behold, I am alive, right? He was resurrected back to life forevermore. And it also says something interesting. And have the keys of hell and death. Wow. Now, I'd like to share something interesting with you that I found a couple years ago and uh, concerning the French language and the name Jesus. Now, I'm not sure if you guys knew this or not, but French is my second language. And in the French language, the phrase I am is je, J-E, suis, S-U-I-S. Take a good look at that. Je suis equals I am. What did God tell Moses his name was? God said, tell them, I am sent you. I am. Je suis. Shortened down a bit, we see Jesus. Isn't that cool? And we see the name all over this as being the French phrase, je suis. I am. Anyway, could be something. It could not be. I don't know. But to me, it's something pretty cool. And, uh, it's, you know, it's confirmation of just who our Lord Jesus really is. He is God. He is the I Am. He is the Holy Spirit, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Jewish Messiah, the body of Christ, Jesus Christ. 99% of these verses from, from God's Word are non-Pauline verses. These are verses found all throughout the Bible, not just Paul's books. So I ask you, did Jesus claim to be God? Did Jesus make himself equal to God? Is Jesus God? Why, yes, he is. The entire Bible points out to that fact. It's important you know God's word. The words of Jesus. It answers this question with a profounding yes. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all one being, all three in one, and one being all three. So this opens up another question here. What about the Trinity? Is the Trinity actually taught in the Bible? False teachers, false religions, Islam being one of them, first attack Jesus' identity, then they attack the Trinity. And if you don't know your Bible, you're not going to be able to answer these questions. I can't stress enough how important it is that you know your Bible. Study study by right division know what dispensations are all about so you can answer to these attacks when they come your way it's your armor it's your weapon friends i think for the sake of time and the length of this study already i'm going to go ahead and make another video about the trinity and it's going to be part two of uh, to this video is Jesus God part two and we'll concentrate more on the Trinity in that <clears throat> one video and we'll take a look at what God's Word says about the Trinity the Father the Son the Holy Ghost being equal in all three and all three beings actually making up one being now the Trinity can be confusing to understand if you don't know your Bible however in the next study we'll go over all about the Trinity will rightly divide God's Word and hopefully you'll have no confusions in the future about the Trinity and you'll be able to see just how simple it truly is friends so if you know God's Word rightly divided and you have studied it daily then you should not fear when attacks come your way thanks for studying with me saints peace love and grace in Christ Jesus be with all of you and I'll see you on part two to this video.